This is Duke University. President Obama comes to office on a wave of both national and international goodwill. There is probably no one in history who has been more prayed for uh, and more liked around the world. There's a kind of global honeymoon about to start, which gives him a remarkable opportunity to get some good things done and done early. Let me make some suggestions in the hope that he is watching this on iTunes. Hi, Mr. President. <laughs> Firstly, um, President-elect President Obama can put into practice the notion that he has already begun to articulate that U.S. interest abroad does not have to be primarily belligerent, military, or self-interested. There would be no successful peace process in Ireland if President Clinton had not supported Senator Mitchell's attempts at negotiating a settlement. This was a good thing. This was a kind of a selfless thing, certainly on an individual level. George Mitchell spent, I think, something like seven years in Belfast. And I think he'd originally agreed to come for three months. And he didn't, he didn't take a fee for it either. He got his hotel and his transport paid for. This was an example of American goodwill, North, of U.S. American goodwill in the world that actually worked. And yeah, I mean, you could see Clinton wanted the Irish-American vote, but he was going to get the Irish-American vote anyway. Uh, so one of the things President Obama can do is dial back this notion that the only things the U.S. should do overseas are defensive posture, belligerence, military or self-interested. When U.S. diplomacy is offered in good faith and humility, two facets that have been sorely neglected by the outgoing administration, it can actually change the world. Secondly, the new president can recognize that, as Michael Tiger said here recently, individuals, institutions, and nations behave as they do, at least partially as a result of their perceived needs. Since 9-11, there has been a vast swath of the U.S. population who perceive the need for security and safety much more than before and in much more anxiety-inducing ways. The tragedy of the Bush administration's response to 9-11 is not only that many thousands of lives have been lost in military misadventure without bringing those responsible for the killings of 9-11 to justice, but that in simple terms, we are more afraid than ever. It's therefore understandable, if not defensible, that invading Afghanistan or Iraq or losing civil liberties or ratting on your neighbors has been seen not merely as the lesser of many evils, but as a patriotic duty. It may sound naive to suggest that President Obama should work to calm people's fears by showing that there is a better way to respond to violent threat than by force of arms and shredding the Constitution. But the fears about the outside world that reached near epidemic proportions in this country over the past few years are themselves quite naive. The question arises, what can be done to allay people's fears? There are many facets to the right answer, but I'll just mention one. President Obama needs to show frightened people that he both understands their fears and is not going to take actions that will put them in jeopardy. Caricaturing the sincerely held fears of others, whether they're expressed in person by an elderly couple in the Midwest frightened of a nuclear attack from Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, or by Bill O'Reilly from his bully pulpit will not take away the sting or social power of these fears just by making fun of them. President Obama could usefully begin by reasserting the recent statement endorsed by five former U.S. Secretaries of State, including Dr. Kissinger, hardly a soft-hearted, unthinking pacifist, that high-level diplomacy with perceived enemies is not merely acceptable but fundamentally necessary. And if that doesn't work, perhaps quoting an old speech might. It was less than 50 years ago when the U.S. had just faced another existential threat manifested in the Cuban Missile Crisis that a man employed rhetoric that would now seem astonishing in its wide-eyed liberal do-goodery. 
The rhetoric said simply that the U.S. should think of the Soviet Union not exclusively as an enemy, but as a group of nations in which resided millions of people with hopes and dreams just like us, and that while it is necessary to be vigilant against potential threats, it is not a betrayal of American values to ask ourselves what we can learn from the Soviets for peace is in our mutual interest. That particular wide-eyed liberal do-gooder was President Kennedy, by the way. And his rhetoric literally changed the world, helping provide the Soviets with the face-saving moisturizer necessary to negotiate the limited test ban treaty. Sometimes being nice makes nice. <laughs> Three, words are important. <clears throat> and so the third lesson I think the next president might learn from Northern Ireland is to stop using the language of war on terror. It's unproductive, and it divides the world into those who are for and those who are against, which simply means that the battle lines are redrawn. The game is the same, kill or be killed. The game needs to be reframed. War on terror is itself a paradoxical phrase. Aren't they both the same thing? More than that, it enshrines the events of 9-11 as epoch-making, as if nothing so terrible had ever happened before. The truth is simply this. Nothing so terrible as 9-11 had ever happened before to us. It could have been an opportunity to identify with and to allow empathy to come our way from others who have suffered terror for so long elsewhere. It could also have been an opportunity not to make the same mistakes as other failed policies have led to, such as internment without trial, racial or ethnic profiling, refusing to engage with the possibility that the reasons offered by terrorist rhetoric might deserve some attention, even while prosecuting through US and international law the horror of their actions. These were supposed to be the building blocks of security in Northern Ireland, internment without trial, a form of ethnic profiling, refusing to engage with the reasons that the terrorists were giving, having, uh, not having an accountable justice system. They were supposed to be the building blocks of security, but they became in, actually part, in actuality part of the reason the violence continued for so long. And if abandoning, if abandoning the language of war on terror seems a little too Chomsky-esque to be practical, let me, and with all due respect to Noam Chomsky, let me, who I'm sure is also watching, uh, let me reassure you that the most recent public figure to assert that this language is harming the chances of peace and security was Stella Remington, the recently retired head of MI5. That's right, James Bond's boss thinks we should talk to terrorists because it's the only thing that works. Four, and in talking, President Obama should figure out what dialogue doesn't mean as much as what it does. He'll need to help frighten people to see that they have nothing to fear from dialogue. Dialogue does not require us to give up our grievances, but it may ask us to give up the right to revenge, and we need to figure out the difference between revenge and security, because I think that security has spilled over into revenge in the last seven years. And dialogue is not the government's job alone. It works far better when supported by civic society, faith traditions, NGOs, universities, and so on. We all have a role to play. <coughs> Fifthly, President Obama should move immediately to restore the rule of accountable legal structures. Just as one of the preconditions for a negotiated settlement in Northern Ireland was the ending of internment, the release of prisoners, and so on, there is little hope of change in what he hopefully won't be calling the war on terror anymore unless the abuses of civil liberties enacted by the Bush administration are revoked and seen to be revoked. The obvious examples are a serious reconsideration of the Patriot Act and the closing of Guantanamo Bay. 9-11 should be recognized as a crime, a barbaric crime, and it should be responded to with the full rigor of the accountable law. No one is suggesting we should just forget about it. But this does not mean that we can't also be seeking to understand why it happened. And if there are wrongs to be righted on our part, then we should right them. And then there are some huge philosophical questions that deserve attention. And at the risk of utter oversimplification, let me very briefly mention them. Northern Ireland now operates on the basis of the politics of consensus. We share power together. 
we require a majority of both communities, Protestant and Catholic, to adopt new laws. Majority rule is neither the best nor the only system that works, and this is worthy of reflection. Secondly, finding a sensitive and politically realistic way to understand cultures of shame and honor is really important, both for engaging with the Middle East and addressing the real concerns and fears of many ordinary US citizens who will be skeptical of President Obama. If you think back to the start of the, of the most recent war in Iraq when President Bush told Saddam he had 48 hours to get out, I mean, there's lots of reasons why Saddam wouldn't have left <laughs> in response to that, but one of them is to do with the Middle Eastern culture of shame and honor. There are some murky examples of nasty people like Saddam being told by people who really hate them, you know what, you're a really great leader, but we know that you want to, you want to move on, and we find this nice, friendly country just a few hundred miles away who are prepared to put you up in a mansion and you can live in luxury for the rest of your life. This has happened before when dictators have been removed. You've got to understand cultures of shame in order to make that happen. Something like that could have been attempted. Or he could have been kidnapped and taken to the Hague. There's also a murky history of that kind of thing happening too. There was absolutely no need for a war in order to remove Saddam from power, if that's really what they wanted to happen. So cultures of shame and honor are important. Thirdly, both pacifists and those who would endorse the idea of a just war can agree on one thing. And that is that less violence is better than more violence. So ultimately, the question we're faced with is a practical one. What actually works in reducing violence? Not what is most ideologically pure or what fits our politics best, but what has been shown to work elsewhere in reducing violence. Finally, the next president has the task of leading the people of the United States in understanding that conflict is complex. This is why I took time to explain the many dimensions of Northern Ireland. If you address only one aspect of a conflict, the violence done to the US, for instance, you will not solve it. Smoking out the evildoers neither works, nor does it help create policy proposals that will lead to peaceable change. <coughs> there are things that every individual can do to help achieve this. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.